you very much. Uh, I'm not sure. That was a very nice introduction. I, I'm not sure I bought enough money. Do you take a credit card? <laughs> Obviously, I'm very humble and honored to um, be recovering, uh, receiving this award. Uh, I'd like to take just a moment to thank my uh, staff and co workers for the incredible work they do because they're the ones that really make something like this possible. My dad only had an eighth grade education, but he was probably one of the smartest people I've ever known. And he always uh, advocated and talked about the fact that if you want to be successful in life, uh, you surround yourself with uh, successful people and good people. And to the best of my ability, I've attempted to do that. And I'd like to take just a moment, to get, I'll get settled down here in a minute. <laughs> I'd like to acknowledge some of those people that have been so incredible and helpful in my life. First and foremost, of course, is my wife, uh, Senator Patty Ann Lodge. I know she'll deny it, but I think maybe in a former life uh, she must have been on an appellate court. Because she <laughs> seems to be able to reverse me almost. <laughs> and my staff, uh, Nancy Baskin. Lori Thompson and Nicole Prada, uh, they too seem to think if the Ninth Circuit reverses me, it's my decision. If they affirm me, uh, it's their decision. <laughs> <laughs> the person could get uh, gray hair over there. So. <laughs> Diane Chamberlain was uh, my in court deputy, and uh, she's the one that keeps us all lined out and going in the right direction, helps with the uh, trials and she does an excellent job. Lisa Ant uh, is the court reporter and of course she has to take every word that's spoken even when two or three people are talking and she too does a great job. When our children were growing up Patty and I always emphasized the importance of education. That education gives you power. The power to make decisions and to make choices that you might never be able to make otherwise. One day, uh, my children turned the question around and asked me if I was a good student. And uh, it caught me off guard, and I, the only thing I could come up with was, uh, well, good, in the eyes of the older. <laughs> but uh, I was probably sixth or seventh in my law class. And then my wife had to tell them that there were only nine in my class. <laughs> 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 So maybe it's a miracle that I'm here. Uh, when I was asked to say a few words uh, here this evening, uh, I thought about talking about uh, some of the funny things, some of the serious things that have happened in court over the last uh, 53 years, but I realized it was going to take too long. And uh, when I get old, uh, I might write a book. <laughs> I have to wait another day. So I did. Well, I concluded, I'm going to tell you a true story about a time in my life when I dropped the ball, failed the bar exam, and might have failed uh, if it hadn't been for a life-threatening experience at a later time in, on the ranch. Why would I tell you something like that uh, when it happened so many years ago and when it was so embarrassing at the time? The value in any lesson is the opportunity to pass it on and to try to help somebody else avoid that mistake. I've been, uh, I actually thought I was going to be talking to more law students uh, than uh, maybe you're here, but uh, I was going to tell them, I've been your age, you haven't been 82. <laughs> Experience is sometimes the best teacher. My hope, of course, is uh, after you hear my story that uh, you are and if you're pursuing something that you want to do, even if you hit a bump in the road, that you stay the course, that you believe in yourself, to make the right decision for the right reason, and that you understand the future is not ours to see. If that happens with just one of you, I will feel richly uh, rewarded. I went to law school pretty much by accident. I really hadn't thought about law school at all, but like, Parents were having a, 
that it's a problem uh, with the water on the Jordan Valley Ranch. And the lawyer mentioned to my dad that uh, you're going to, you have this ranch, you have this automobile business, you're going to have problems from time to time. Uh, you've got four boys. One of them should go to law school. <laughs> and the finger got pointed at me. But up to that point, I'd never even really thought about it. But the more I thought about it, uh, I realized that playing football and being a lawyer had a lot of things in common. That they're both very competitive. Uh, they both require a game plan from time to time. You have to make adjustments when the facts and maybe the talent aren't 100% on your side. And you have to accept risks and challenges as a way of life. So I went to law school and everything went fine until the bar exam. And, uh, I was living at uh, my folks' home at the time. I came down for breakfast one morning and the silence was deafening. I knew something terrible had happened. And uh, finally my mom spoke up and she said, Ed, you failed the bar. I knew they were terribly disappointed and hurt. For my sake, I felt embarrassed disappointed as well and that's when you start making excuses for yourself but I didn't like law school that much uh, that being a lawyer wasn't maybe as appealing as I thought it might be and then I always came back with the excuse that I wanted to be a rancher I was ignoring everything that my coaches and my family had taught me about not quitting when the chips are down I heard what they said but I didn't listen and I took the easy way out. I went to work at the ranch. I was breaking a horse at the time when I went to the ranch and uh, he was a little bit nervous. Uh, we were sorting cattle, the conditions were icy and the horse went down hard, uh, slipped and uh, I knew almost immediately that I was hung up and that uh, my foot had been driven through the, the stirrup. I was trying to keep him down until the other individual could help me, but that didn't happen. And the horse got up and he was kicking and striking at me and that kept him in kind of a tight circle. But uh, shortly thereafter, he broke for the open area and it was just a matter of a few yards. And we were going to be into a rock, the rocky hillside and a big sagebrush and almost certain death. The horse did break for that open area, and I was hitting the ground only about every 15 or 20 feet, but I was hitting hard enough that somehow my foot came out of the stirrup. I was laying there for just a minute or so, and I think my whole life went in front of my eyes. Uh, I'd realized, uh, you know, that I was hurt, but I didn't, that didn't even pass through my mind. What passed through my mind was the fact that I had uh, let failure, I had let uh, the possibility of failing be a part of my life. Uh, I knew at that moment that, uh, that I, well, let me just back up. I, I was, uh, Laying there, as I mentioned, and uh, of course I, I knew that uh, I'd allowed myself to think in terms of quitting. That's what I wanted to say. I, I disappointed my family, and more importantly, I disappointed myself. And as strange as it may sound, uh, I thought I heard a voice uh, saying, Ed, uh, you uh, didn't go to law school to be a failure. You didn't go to law school to quit. Uh, so I did go back and I took the bar and of course the rest is history <laughs> when I think about it I just shudder to think about what I would have given up if I had not gone back and taken the bar I've had the privilege as I mentioned to serve on the, both the state and federal bench for 53 years I've had the best seat in the house <laughs> <laughs> I would not have had the privilege of presiding over a number of high-profile cases. Uh, just to mention a few, not for the purpose of bragging, but just for the purpose of trying to illustrate 
or they would have given up by quitting. Claude Dallas case, the Ruby Ridge case, Duncan that was just uh, on appeal to the United States Supreme Court, dismissed the defendant's appeal and he's facing the death penalty. I think I'm the only judge that uh, has had the opportunity to try two first degree murder trials to two juries at the same time. I had the Cirkovich trial that was the largest uh, raid in the history of Idaho for prostitution and gambling. I had the uh, civil case uh, up in uh, Coeur d'Alene that uh, involved the upper third of the Coeur d'Alene Lake. There was a lot of Indian treaties. A lot of things that, that were involved in that case, that also went to the Supreme Court of the United States. Uh, probably is just as important, I've had the privilege of watching lawyers battle mentally almost on a day-to-day -day basis. And I've had the privilege of watching juries resolve very complicated uh, legal and factual issues as well as money uh, decisions. Again, I, I try to say this not to be bragging, but just to illustrate what I would have given up had I allowed myself to continue to fail. The important thing in, in my judgment is if, you, if things go wrong, don't go wrong with them. Attitude, of course, is everything. If you think you can or you think you can't, you're probably right. It's for others to say and to judge, but I personally feel that I might have been maybe a better judge than I might have been otherwise if I haven't had this experience. I think it's causing you to keep a more open mind and try to try to see the two sides of an issue. I'm not advocating failure. I can tell you, having tasted both success and failure, I, I like the taste of success. <laughs> Oliver Goldsmith uh, once said, success is simply getting up one more time than your fall. So the bottom line then is if at first you uh, don't succeed, try and try again. You have nothing to lose and everything to gain. So I'd like to leave you with this thought, uh, neither success nor failure are final without your permission. Thank you very much. I'm going to have to start with an apology. <laughs> and as you hear, even doctors get sick. <laughs> Fortunately, I'm on the tail end of this, and many of you may have suffered this recently. Uh, there's an incredible amount of viral illness going around our community right now, and it's an occupational hazard. <laughs> so pardon me as I croak through my talk. I'd like to, again, thank you all for coming. It's a real gift of time for you to come and honor Judge Lodge and myself. You know, it takes a village of people to really make a community special. And so thank you for being contributors to that. Because in that kind of service to the community, we all benefit. So thank you for that. I want to say that uh, I'm deeply honored by Concordia Law School for this honor. Many times, all of us in our daily lives do things that you don't want or expect credit for. And I was very surprised when I got contacted that I had been chosen as their leader in action for education. That's a huge honor. And so, Dean Seilig and Provost Walters, thank you very much for that. As Judge Lodge well said, it takes many people for something like this to happen. People well beyond yourself. So I want to thank my faculty, my residents, my colleagues at the Family Medicine Residency of Idaho. I want to thank all those people who through my life helped me be better. I want to thank my patients because they've taught me more than I probably helped them. And there's a real gift in that from knowing people and having a relationship of trust with them. But I also want to thank my family because without family, I don't think any of us can truly reach our true potential. 
So here tonight uh, are several of my family members. My mother-in-law, Norma Armstrong, who's back there. My cousin, Keith Taylor, who flew in from Seattle. I was shocked to see him. I can't believe this. And my wife, Lindy. Today is her birthday. Oh. It's just like her to be here supporting me as opposed to having a birthday celebration. But that's what 42 years of marriage will do. <laughs> and that's what makes a person truly better than they are. I'd like to start with telling you a story, a true story of how I became a physician. I was 11 years old and the oldest of five children when my youngest sister, Jill, was born in 1965. She was born with congenital rubella, now a totally preventable disease from being vaccinated. In 1965, and when my mother was pregnant in 1964, that just wasn't available. And my sister was born with tremendous birth defects that were orthopedic, cardiac, and neurologic. Her life lasted four years. And she died in Salt Lake City, undergoing experimental heart surgery. My father called me, and as the oldest of the remaining children, I was now age 15. He said, Ted, will you let your brother and sisters know? And I told my father on the spot that I wanted to become a physician. I had really never given it any thought. But it's in those moments that your life changes. Her life ended, mine started. The door to her life closed, the window to my life opened. And it really was one of those transformational moments we all experience. And as Judge Lodge said, it's, what are you going to do with that opportunity that really starts to define a life? <clears throat> I've now been in medicine for 40 years, 35 years as a family physician. And I've developed a lot of perspective on the profession. I'm amazed at the changes I've seen. Information technology is unbelievable. New medications, new procedures, robotic surgery, breathtaking in many ways. But I've also seen things that aren't so good. In some ways, we've kind of lost our way because the profession of medicine and teaching has always been about service to others. And I've seen a transformation over time in terms of the disease a person has has become more important than the person themselves. I've seen that the business of medicine has become more about making money than it is around service to people and to the community that we all live in. And to that end, I think that drove me to be an educator, to help train a future of physicians that would refine what it was that was at the basis of why we chose the profession in the first place. But I tend to be an optimist. And as Provost Wallers and I were talking about as the evening started, I find that optimism is contagious. You want to be around people that are positive. In fact, sometimes you actually actively avoid those that are negative. And so I wanted to be a beacon of giving back to different people around being better. I've seen through the years the profession do quite a bit to ensure that we have quality physicians for the United States. Ongoing continuous medical education and maintenance of your board certification is a big deal. 
it used to be that you would go through medical school and your residency, and that was it. There was no further requirements for continuing medical education or the ongoing maintenance of your board certification. It was kind of a one and done system. And you've all witnessed how quickly things are changing in medicine. So I was very happy to be part of a profession in 1969, the American Academy of Family Physicians, who first started the concept of maintenance of certification and ongoing continuing medical education to make sure that you were qualified and competent to care for the community that you are a part of. I've also been a part of the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education, as Natalie spoke to you about, in charge of all residency programs in the United States, 10,000 different programs, 125,000 different physicians, residents, and fellows in training. And we've settled on six core competencies that all of these physicians must have. Patient care, medical knowledge, interpersonal communication skills, an approach to practice-based learning and improvement, systems-based practice, because you have to understand how the systems start to work together for better healthcare. And the last of those six, professionalism back to what we've been losing, the professionalism of what it means to be a physician, to serve one's community, to be a part of making it healthier and better. I've been inspired by the future of what the Family Medicine Residency of Idaho here in Boise is doing. We recruit 16 outstanding medical students each year from all across the, the country. And quite frankly, I'll be totally honest with you, I'm incredibly inspired by these young men and women. The millennial generation has really got their back together. And I recognize that many of us see things in the millennials that we wouldn't quite maybe have done that way or thought that way. <laughs> But what I see in them is this. They're tremendous team players. They have a real commitment to social justice. I have seen a much healthier approach to life balance than the baby boomers, which is the generation I'm in, ever had. And in fact, one of the reasons I think I love education is because I think they teach me more than I teach them. And it's been a real honor for me to be part of touching the future of my training room. In our program, as was mentioned, we have three family medicine residencies. Here in Boise, it's been here for 40 years now. In Caldwell, where we have a rural training track, it's been there since 1993. And in the Magic Valley, it's been there now for the last six years. We have four fellowships, obstetrics, geriatrics, sports medicine, and HIV primary care, so we can continue to train the right sorts of physicians to take care of our community. I love our mission. It's twofold. One is to educate outstanding young physicians to be leaders to transform their communities, not, un, uh, not dissimilar to what Concordia's mission is to train leaders to transform society and the second mission is service especially service to the underserved many of you may or may not know that Boise is a refugee relocation center for the federal government we have 43 different languages spoken by our patients in our clinics right here in Boise Idaho and it's been a real honor to care for folks from all parts of the planet. It trains our residents to be outstanding, compassionate physicians, and it reminds us all of the life journeys and struggles that people have. We also focus on rural. We have 34 different training sites across the state. We actually do incredibly well 
because we recruit people from all across the United States and retaining them in the state of Idaho. In fact, Idaho ranks seventh in the United States in terms of the ability to retain the physicians in the state they train in because of our ability to get them out into Idaho and let them fall in love with an incredible state. We have graduates in almost every community in the state of Idaho, and I'm really, really proud of that. Our program, which many of you probably do not know, is ranked in the top five of 500 different family medicine residencies across the nation. And that's probably little known in Boise, but it's the ability to again treat all sorts of people from all white walks of life in, in two incredible hospitals in both St. Al's and St. Luke's and the Boise VA and to be able to leverage their practice opportunities throughout the state that has placed us that way. I'm really inspired by the fact that we've been able to produce the types of physicians that can truly start to help fix the healthcare problems of our communities. If you take a look at what ails communities, it's lack of timely access to care. It's a system that isn't integrated and coordinated and works to improve the health of people. Physicians work in silos. We're not overly good team players. And because of that, people can fall through the cracks. So it's been amazing to me to work with a group of physicians to help them understand the importance of timely access, of integration, of coordination, of high quality care to achieve what has been termed the triple aim, better health, for communities, a better healthcare experience for people, and to lower the overall cost. We cannot continue on the same cost trajectory without bankrupting our entire nation. With that said, I'd like to start to summarize the three quotes that have always served me very well as an educator. The first was from Confucius. And Confucius said, and many of you will recognize this, if you give a man a fish, he will eat for a day. But if you teach him to fish, he will eat for the rest of his life. Our job <coughs> is not to give all the patients we see and all the residents we teach a fish a day. Ours is to truly teach them how to fish so that they all become responsible for their better health and for the betterment of the community they live in. The second is a quote by Douglas Merrill. And Mr. Merrill said, all of us are smarter than any of us. And it is really true. If you can get a team working together, if you can get them motivated towards the goal, the thought product that will come out of that team will exceed any individual in that team. I think part of our success has been able to then bring forth the best possible thought from a lot of talented people to truly make our communities healthier. The last quote that I'd like to share with you before my voice goes out. <laughs> is from William Butler Gates. And Gates wrote that education isn't the filling of a bucket. It's the lighting of a fire. Our job is to light the fires of these physicians for the rest of their lives. And to be a part of that is truly an honor. <coughs> So I'd like to say again, thank you to Concordia University School of Law for recognizing Judge Lodge and myself tonight. I'm deeply honored by this. And I will continue to work the best I can 
to make our community, our state, and our nation a healthier and better place for all people. Thank you very much.